<laughs> Welcome to the Voices for Voices podcast, sponsored by Redwood Living. Thank you for joining us today. I am Justin Allen Hayes, founder and executive director of Voices for Voices, host and humanitarian. You can learn more about Voices for Voices on our Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube channel at Voices for Voices, and also our website, voicesforvoices.org. Voices for Voices is a 501c3 nonprofit charity organization that survives solely on donations. So if you are able to, please consider heading over to voicesforvoices.org to help us continue our mission and the goal and dream to help three billion people over the course of my lifetime and beyond. Or you can also send a donation to the mailing address of Voices for Voices at 2388 Beckett Circle, Stowe, Ohio, 44224. Or we're also on the Cash App at Voices for Voices. Are you or somebody you know looking for a volunteer opportunity? If so, you can reach out to us today via email at president at voicesforvoices.org. Now I founded Voices for Voices to provide a platform for folks to share their stories with others as we work to break the stigma around mental health, accessibility, and disabilities, helping get people the help they need while also helping them prepare and or transition into the workforce with the Voices for Voices Career Center, where we connect talent with opportunity for both job seekers and employers alike, from coast to coast and in every industry and job level. And who can forget about merchandise? The Voices for Voices merchandise shop is up and running at voicesforvoices.org forward slash shop, where shipping is always free and again, all donations are 100% tax deductible. And we also wanted to announce our third annual Voices for Voices, a brand new day gala fundraiser that will be happening on Friday, October 13th, 2023 from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. Eastern Time at the Leona Ferris Lodge in the Stowe Silver Springs Park and the address for the location is 5027 Stowe Road, Stowe, Ohio, 44224. The keynote speaker you have seen on a previous episode of our podcast is gonna be Mr. Dan Flowers, who is the president and CEO of the Akron Canton Regional Food Bank. There's also gonna be a recipient of the 2023 second annual Voices for Voices Ambassador of the Year. And the recipient for this year is the Honorable Judge Allison Bro. She is from the Summit County Court of Common Pleas, and she founded the Hope Court for individuals with felonies. There will be music, there will be artwork, there will be sign language interpretation from the Kent State University American Sign Language English program. There's gonna be raffle baskets, I mentioned artwork, and all donation, all proceeds are gonna to go to individuals in our community who are battling addiction, mental health, and accessibility. Tickets are on sale on voicesforvoices.org. They are, for an individual ticket, $150, and for a table of six, $750, both options are available and you can find them again on our website. Today, I want you to join me in welcoming our guests from Coral Springs, Florida. They are authors, storytellers, and therapists turned comedy influencers. They like to help people laugh their way to love more and fear less. They're twins. They are the therapy twins, Joan and Jane. Thank you for joining us today. 
Oh, thank you for having us. Thank you so much. And you got our names correct. I, okay, great. Wonderful. I, so not, not that that's bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's so wonderful on your first try. As, <laughs> absolutely. I've actually messed up our names before. People have said, which one are you, Joan or Jane? And then I happen to be Joan, and I said Jane, and I, I don't uh, even know why I said it. I think it comes out of the mouth very easily. Yeah. <laughs> Well, again, thank you for joining us today. And for our, our viewers and our listeners, uh, can you maybe introduce yourselves? Uh, what brought you on the, the journey and the path uh, to, mm -hmm. to therapy? And then we can work ourselves into uh, maybe more of the current state of you know, the comedy, the, the literature, how people uh, can find out about you and support you. Sure. Um, well, did you mean for our own therapy or the fact that we um, are. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can go, you can. You know can... what, the answer's the same. Yeah. Really, um, I, I knew, I'm the older twin. Okay. I don't know what, I only said that because Joan identified her as the young <laughs> self as the younger, I don't, I think, did I? I don't even recall, but I, and I don't know why the older twin even matters in my story, but it might to someone, and that's why I said it. <laughs> and anyway, good save um, on that. Look, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. so I never really knew what was wrong with me uh, growing up, but I knew that I never smiled in my school photos. Mm -hmm. And I, and I knew that there was a song, this is, just is too funny. Oh. I don't even know what grade, but it was elementary school. And I don't really know the song, but Carol King write, wrote a song. And the some of the lyrics is, you have to get up every morning with a smile on your face and show the world all the love in your heart, oh, something like that. And, yes. and it goes on from there. It's a great, it's a great song that I think touches on the positive, like you've got to do that. Yeah. It's, so positive can come back. Well, I never listened to the song, the lyrics, but I recognized it if I heard it. I would listen maybe to the music part, but never the lyrics. So anyway, I was very depressed growing up and just didn't know it. I became a nurse, a, a registered nurse. And of course, in, finally, in my senior year, they started more psychiatry. Oh. And um, I went to um, a four-year college to become a nurse. And in our last year, uh, we did our psychiatric rotation. And I knew, I just absolutely knew. And so I, you, uh, that I was depressed, mentally oh, ill. I mean, yes. I, mean I, I, mm -hmm. I gathered I had a mix of anxiety and depression. So anyway, of course, that's what they say about people. Sometimes we gravitate to those professions to diagnose and treat yourself. Uh, I know. I concur with that. So there. <laughs> but we didn't go to college. Um, we didn't finish nursing school together. I, I ended up dropping out, I guess, if I dropped out. And I often like to tell people that I didn't finish my uh, bachelor's degree until I was 35. Okay. And I did not finish my second master's until I was 45. So if there's time in life for everything. So we were both therapists after registered nurses. And we kind of, I felt a little bit of the stigma within the profession as well. Wow. And I that mm. bugged me. It bugged me. Mm -hmm. And I didn't like the way people spoke about addicts because I was also dating a person who suffered from addiction. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I had a real problem with it. So we decided after we heard this might be a mistake, so I'm gonna take credit for this one because <laughs> I I love making mistakes because that's how I learn. Mm -hmm. Um I thought I heard Vivek Murphy the Surgeon General, when I believe Obama was president. And I believe what he, it was some sort of press conference, and I believe somebody related to him suicided. Hmm. And he was so upset with the mental health in this country that he said, that's so great if a football player, a, mil a billionaire, an actress. A, an actress, you know, all these people that are have a support system because they're so famous, they come out with their mental illness, they're still working. 
for the most part, a couple of people haven't. But he said until the people in the profession come out, like what's going on? Statistically, people in the profession also suffer because otherwise statistics aren't correct. So we said, well, well, we'll do that. And we made it a comedy because we grew up in a comedy. Yes, we did. <laughs> ah, and the depressed one, you know, I was so depressed. And I, hindsight again, I thought, my goodness. <laughs> I had so much <laughs> around me to help me, but I, you know, I had a lot of negative qualities that I mean that I could say, but I don't have to bore people to tears. So I wasn't picking up on all the humor in the home. It was wonderful. Well, even though I was making a lot of the humor with my father, I had extreme negativity. And mm -hmm. can you imagine that compounded? We had our own language when we were born. Mm -hmm. And, you know, no one could get into the house. We hear from our yes. aunts and uncles that we were like watchdogs. <sighs> we didn't want anyone in the house except for, and this is odd, mm -hmm. except for our mom got locked out of the house. She went to get the mail, and she was so frightened to death since her birth <laughs> that she locked the door when she went to get the mail. Right. She forgot the key, and we were infants on the floor in diapers. Oh, my gosh. And uh, the fire department had to be called, and they had to axe or, or whatever. They, they had, had to, to axe their way in. <laughs> and our mother said, how could they, she was talking to the relatives, how did they not cry, like, one bit? So firefighters, that's who we should have married. Yes. I can't believe that. <laughs> we firefighters, we loved them, yes. apparently. We didn't cry. <laughs> So, did we share enough? <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, it, it, it's interesting that people, to hear people in, in the field uh, have that, a little bit of that, that, that stigma too, because I've often wondered what they, what they think and, and how they think, and, and then secondly, hearing stories and experiences day after day, that that, if, if I'm just thinking for me, that would really be tough to not yes. bring some of that baggage home, but everywhere you go. Yes. yes. You know, you have to work your way up to, as a therapist to have those long sessions for an eight or, or longer hour day. Uh, I remember one time um, my boss asked me, how, did, how many hours did I want to start out with? And I, I was a single mom and I said, oh, I have to go 40 hours a week. And he chuckled at me and he said, taught me that I had to work my way up to that. And then there are ways that you sort of protect yourself from the negativity or you're absolutely right. Yeah. You'll absorb that and go home with it. Mm. Um, but there's something really, it, it is built in, in the education of therapists that whenever you overly like someone or overly dislike someone that is the, the important time to seek your own mentors out okay um, you know figure that out because you never want to be judgmental right. to a patient right uh, especially in psychiatry and you know i say especially and then that's true absolutely everywhere you know i did some medicine and it's absolutely true there too what was the what was maybe the, the, the toughest part of be, becoming a, a therapist? Was it the different, I'd say, uh, the different mental health challenges, learning all those? Um, if you were a prescriber, because I'm just, I'm just wondering, like, what going through my life that kind of is similar to, 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 to yours and, and, and the challenges and ups and the downs? Uh, you know, how? We actually did prescribe as well. Um, I guess, was that difficult? I, that We were math majors, too. Okay. And then I have another master's in forensic science. So sometimes the prescribing and the mathematics of all of that and the interactions, if you didn't catch it, the pharmacist, they were your best friend. Okay. Pharmacists are so knowledgeable. For, for um, including me, if I go into the um, pharmacy to get a medication, I am thrilled at how much they know. So um, what was that question? Well, I think one of the hardest uh, <laughs> things to do. Yeah, yeah, prompt my memory. It, well, I mean, so coming, I, that's, I, I realize now why I wanted to share my depression. Um, if we back up to Jane and Joan, we were born in 1960, mm -hmm. okay. premature, not expected to survive. 
So I imagine back in the 60s, the neonatal intensive care unit was not as advanced. Mm -hmm. And it was not until sometime in the 70s when nurses decided that in the NICU, if I could call it that, um, that mothers and fathers are extremely important or whoever the primary caregivers are to this baby, yeah. they're so important. They need to touch these babies. So yes. can we back up to 1960? So we spent 30 days, which right. doesn't sound like a lot, but bonding with an infant is extremely important for both people's health. And um, the other thing is, is for they, 30 days, for 30 where did days, we spend our we time? We were in separate incubators, and I don't know if they allow infants in a NICU to be, um, in, twins to be in the same, but I've read multiple articles with the human touch, including an identical or fraternal twin is extremely important. Mm. So I know that, well, I'm gonna speak for both of us. We do share some antisocial personality traits. Sorry, yeah. And so maybe uh. the biggest thing for me, and I hope none of my <laughs> former clients are listening, because I adored, I, care. I adored every single one of them. And if I did not, I got a lot of help so that I could fake it till I did like them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So anyway, we, we had these antisocial type personality traits and, um, and where are we going? With I'm this? going with to be a therapist. There's oh. all this empathy and, yes. and I have read, forgive me, gentlemen. I have read that, um, women, well, men and women and everyone in between, every human has a different style of how they listen and process. And Joan and I have realized, I mean, it, hands down, we have ADHD, of course. I was primarily inattentive and Joan can share her. I don't want to, I was too active. Too active. <laughs> like I, Joan like had the city was H. running through me. But, it was but very bad. She had the very H, bad. But the, 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 Remember, so we're going to school and unsatisfactory and self control <laughs> oh. bad on my report card. I mean, I didn't even know it. I didn't even know that. And we think that AD, ADD may have been being treated back then just a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. But they were always a little, the little boy. They never really looked at the little girl yet. Uh, so neither one of us got any treatment because um, mm -hmm. the inattentive type, my grades were so good. They, no one thought anything. They thought I was reading and comprehending what I was reading. And that's, she knows how to skim very well. And there was mm -hmm. something back in the uh, 70s called Cliff Notes. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. Wow, was that wonderful uh, to learn. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that was how they first treated us, I think. <laughs> Anyway, where was this going? Oh, I'm not sure. It was, was it empathy? You said something about yeah. empathy. And therapy. I, I, was, I thought we were talking about oh. one, what was one of the most difficult things for me. It was practicing the art of empathy. It was, oh. it was difficult. You know, you have to appear concerned. Oh yeah. And if you don't, <laughs> well, I think I uh, I was very concerned. But yeah. uh, what I used to do was I'm the I was a comedian. I wanted to be a comedian. I wanted to do all kinds of things when I was younger. Um, a model because we were so tall, um, but my anxiety got in the way. In fact, in school, when they tested us and they said, come on, just answer these questions with honestly, and it will come out what you'd be, what you would work at, like for a job. And mine came out jet pilot. So I said, perfect, I'll do that. But then I realized I get air sick. That wasn't going to go well either. So I couldn't do it. So I followed, I'm the younger twin. I just followed her. And I wanted to go into advertising, but oh. in the 78 is when we graduated, 1978, like anyone would graduated thought, high school. graduated high school, um, it, in, in the middle class upbringing we had in the area of Connecticut we grew up in, I felt I had three choices, a nurse, a school teacher, or a secretary. Mm -hmm. And I chose nurse because just... I hated high school so much. There was no, I couldn't imagine going back. Yeah. I just couldn't even, and I hated it because I oh, was as a so teacher, you stressed. <laughs> I think the anxiety and the depression and, you know, I didn't know how to talk to anybody. Oh, mm -hmm. I have very few memories. And I'm so grateful for the handful of people on Facebook that are so nice to me mm -hmm. that we all went to high school together. It's lovely. <laughs> right. It's just lovely. <laughs> right. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. No, I don't think I had a story. You go you ahead. Um, I, I'm just curious about your your thoughts on 
early diagnosis in, in life and life, given that, like you mentioned, that younger girls, baby girls, it, it, you know, it w weren't looked at because you had the grades. You know, growing up, you, you had, had the grades, and so maybe that wasn't the indicator that was checked. So it's like, oh, okay, well, we don't have to worry about her in this mm -hmm. particular area. Um, and the reason mm -hmm. I ask, just kind of your, your opinions, uh, because I'm, I learned when I was 35, uh, now a lot of that I balled up inside and didn't want to deal with, and uh, maybe there were, were, were signs and people trying to help me towards that or, or, or not, mm -hmm. but uh, some, something that I, I get asked often is like, you know, what do you mean you didn't know you had autism, you know, low spectrum mm -hmm. autism until you were 35? You know, that should have been diagnosed before you were 10 or before, th these certain mm -hmm. ages. And, um, and I kind of let that just roll off the, the side of me because so many people have brought it up and, and now it's becoming a little bit more, I want to say a little bit more common, but more people are, are, are talking about, you yeah. know, find out right. a little, little bit later. Uh -huh. What are, what are your, uh -huh. your, your thoughts if, so, if somebody may be getting those, you know, good grades and, and they're kind of passing all those tests, but maybe they do have some of those feelings of, like, what, what should they do? I, I think both ways here. I think there's positives and negatives. Once yeah. you diagnose, what what happens in psychiatry anyway, once somebody's diagnosed, that person is pushed aside now. Now they're labeled and it is very easy once you're labeled for mean girls, and I'm joking, <laughs> you know, people yeah. who maybe didn't have that art of empathy learned or taught <laughs> to them. I heard humans had to be taught empathy. Mm. Monkeys, mm. I read a long time ago, I cannot find that article that monkeys had it innately. So I, don't I thought, think wow, do. but we're, and the, so when you get labeled and then, yeah. then you're prejudiced against, and I, that I don't like. And when people come to um, therapy, what they, well, I always told everybody, but they, a <laughs> lot of people said, oh, I only went a few times to therapy, so I never had a diagnosis. And I'm thinking the therapist didn't get paid unless they put a diagnosis in. So uh, yeah, you were diagnosed uh, and it's uh, going to pop up somewhere at least in Connecticut, because that's where we practiced. Mm -hmm. So there were diagnoses you could pick that was a reaction to stress or lifestyle. But I cried after I retired and had time to read a book, which is because <laughs> our book is um, about our traumas. So we had in been, a lighthearted way. Yeah. We, di we were diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder very late, like 35. And uh, for me, the unfortunate part is I didn't get treatment until I was 35. So anyway, um, about the, I don't know where I was going with that either. <laughs> no, 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 that, that, no, that, that, that's good. Cause I mean, I was 35 yeah. around when, yeah, when yeah. kind of that, that, uh -huh. that came in and just processing it is, is one thing, but how did your life's experiences lead to, uh, publish a book, uh, because not everybody has that kind of inside right, them to be able right. to and tell the story. Especially two chicks with attention deficit disorder it or so some difficult. type of process. It, for yeah. us, it's other people write with ease. For us yeah. with the ADD, honest to goodness, we are in um, paper and pencil still. Well, that's probably <laughs> our age. And then we tear things out. We don't even want to erase. And it's, it's a pen and then you got to put arrows in it. Yeah. For us, it was difficult. You know, you know what I think it was? Is what was that? I'm pretty sure I didn't come up with the idea. I, I mean, why would I? Someone that has such trouble. I'm a rebel. I wanted it I, out. I know that um, we wanted to write a book. Well, Joan came up with the idea, right? Because we just wanted more people to have access to some of the stuff. Because we the feedback we got from our book, which is... Um, 40 pages made. I don't even know how many pages. 57, 57 originally. Yeah. I don't know. We put it um, back up again. It's different pages now. It has, it um, prevented two suicides that we know of. Oh, I forgot. Oh, so man. it may, I mean, and w preventing one was good enough for yeah. us. I mean, we knew we wanted other people to share this, you know, this twin thing is pretty funny too. Yeah. Um, you know, we again, practiced together. Yeah, and, uh, yeah. We had our own practice and, yeah. you know, Jane had her own office. I had my own office, but, you know, clients couldn't tell us apart. And then <laughs> right. it got very comedic because yeah. people would say, 
Joan, uh, I don't know, my clients always talked about weight. And in, in mental health, you talk about a holistic approach if you're a nurse practitioner, because a nurse's whole thing is yeah. holistic. You're never just gonna do neck up. Yeah. What did you used to call it? Something. <laughs> anyway, I was always funny, but people would always say to me, I'm the thinner twin. And they would say, Joan, there's 0% chance that I am discussing weight with you. <laughs> but when Jane has a minute, I would, you know, I'll discuss it with her. So that was funny. It was um, sex, food, wow. And um, there was something else, I'm sure. Parenting, that they always wanted to speak with Jane. Because okay. uh, I obviously, it was so obvious I had no children, the way mm -hmm. I spoke to mm -hmm. the And on my parents. end, uh, uh, <laughs> and I probably have more experience dating than Joan, but <laughs> some relationship issues, they, wa they wanted Joan's opinion. Like they wanted difficulty with it, sex sometimes. You know, it, that's as clean or, as I go. you know, run by what it was with Joan. Yes. Um, and, you know, I'll say she was kinder. I mean, she's had um, longer lasting uh, loving relationships than I've had. Mm -hmm. So I've had maybe some female friends. <laughs> That's because I don't have any issues with females <laughs> that I know of. <laughs> anyway, anyway, God gave me a male cat, my first male cat, and then uh, prior to that, my son. And I adore men now, okay, because now I'm really telling my clients that I didn't like them and I, when I absolutely loved all of them but, but getting anyway. back to the book <laughs> yeah. which is called under the hood and we thought you know under our hoods mm -hmm. if it was um a car we were thinking i don't know like to coming out of mm. with our mental illness i think somebody helped us with that time oh of course the editor dallas thank you wow that was weird i'm usually the one who's so uh -huh. generous uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad i'm glad. let's go back to the twin thing maybe i wouldn't have, would not have done it if i was a single person but because you have a twin, for me, I always know that I'll never be alone. I mean, unless she gets hit by a car suddenly. But I won't be alone because it's, I have her. So I think you're more heroic sometimes because you can do things, you know, things like that. And that's what we did. So we came out with our illness, but our upbringing was hilarious. Mm. And most people have said that they have fallen off yes. their chair because they yes. really aren't it's at, like the Anthony Jezel the comedian. At, at Joan's expense. A yeah, lot usually of at them. my expense. It was expense. pretty funny. They and they didn't. They were so like, they were hesitant to say it because if if you read it, Joan has had, uh, in my opinion, worse trauma when somebody thought I did, but I don't think so. Anyway, it's really cute. And then at the end, what we do is we give um, the tips that had helped us uh -huh. may not help you, but right. even those tips are so ADHD friendly because. I would have a hard time working a, a manual, a self-help manual or a class at this point. Mm -hmm. It's just hard. Oh, yeah, nobody, I mean, do you and really work to... for a living? They don't have as much time these days. Yeah. So that's what we did. Yeah. And it's yeah. out. And, yeah, right. <laughs> then there you have it. Go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, yeah, yeah the, at the end of the book, I forgot why we re, re put it out on Amazon. It's And it's Amazon.uk. Please, we made it. Don't even mistake. ask. Don't even ask. It's just a wonder. It came out wonderful. I'm so happy because the UK, we actually had two jobs in the UK. Yes. When America wouldn't put us, because I think America's hesitant with mental illness. Yeah. We're a young country. Anyway, it's on Amazon. And at the very end, I believe it's 24. If you think that older women have words of wisdom after our life experience, because believe me, our life was very negative 35 and under. And then up going forward, it's a little better. So it's words of wisdom cards, you know, like pay at the pump or yeah. pay later, but we explain it. Where can, uh, not, not only the, the, the book, uh, but how can people follow you and follow what, what, what's oh. coming next? Oh, on, ahead, every, on every social media, we are therapy twins. Okay. And apparently people on Twitter thought we were rap artists because they said, <laughs> no, the rappy twins. And I guess that does spell out, I think there should have been an extra P. But no, we're the therapy twins, one word. Okay. And you'll see we look identical. We dress alike now. It, it's that incubator thing. They don't do that yeah, anymore. I, you know, the public they, needs, they don't needs separate. to know that you're not going to get bombarded by twins like this. The people might start to panic. Like, <laughs> oh, no, two of them. Oh, no, for this long. You, one time we had run into a handful of identical twins that both were security guards, for example. <laughs> both were doctors. In, you know, the restaurant business. Mm -hmm. Both were doctors. In fact, 
our doctor, not our not our mother's obstetrician, but our fam our pediatrician was also an identical twin. And so we hit the newspapers yeah. in 1960 yeah. just to look like a little carnival act. Yeah, it was a freak show. It wasn't it. But anyway, what happens is remember the nurses intervened in the 70s and said, babies need to touch each other and mommies, daddies, et cetera, need to touch their babies, it's all that. So that human touch and they don't separate twins as early in school anymore. So you're not gonna have this retiree mm -hmm. you know senior center right here right here and we dress alike oh, no, to avoid just... an argument usually yeah. because yeah. i don't understand where she got the scarf mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. now the store doesn't carry mm -hmm. it so that's a problem <laughs> but the other thing it does every single time we ex exit um Sorry. our whatever this a condo is is it puts a smile on at least one person's face and and offers on um, almost everywhere we go strangers are speaking to us and, and laugh and laughing and again if we can prevent any sadness to the worst outcome mm -hmm. that's what we are here to do oh because our names jane looks up names and spiritual meanings and mm -hmm. jane's very spiritual and i'm trying so hard she'll say to me sometimes how many more signs do you need that there is a heaven? And I do. I need a couple of more. Couple but then I, signs. I do. I tease her with cognitive behavioral therapy because mm -hmm. if she says, "Well, I just would rather be in the ground," and I'm like, "Be careful! <laughs> be careful what you're affirming, Joan." Yeah, I, I changed that up. I believe fantastic fungi. I think really helped me believe that there's an afterlife. Anyway. Um, Right. I hope you remember. What you, yeah, what I did, and then I switched really up. Did, did you remember what we were talking? Put smiles on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it, 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 it's it's. When we go out, everyone it's, talks to him. Oh, Jane looks up names, names. and what it means. Yeah. Yes. It, so we were reflecting back upon what our names meant, and you know, our names actually mean gift from God. Can you believe that? So oh. we're gifting a lot we're of trying things. To gift. Yes, we try very hard to gift back. Are you and be grateful? Yes. Some of like some of the similarities, uh, like are you both right with the left or right hand or right handed, or both right handed. Okay. Um, well, I don't. I guess we were. I think. See, I was an artist, but I did different art than Jane. Jane was more abstract, and I was very linear. <laughs> very. She's being kind to me. <laughs> it's that she won the flag coloring contest. <laughs> in first grade or kindergarten and i was simply devastated so i um so she, far she had a period of time in her life very very unfortunate where she cut music out and i had a long period of time in my life where i cut any type of art drawing and stuff out and it's just not good for you to cut that out well as human beings we do yeah. things like that we spite ourselves when we're oh, in we a cut off our nose argument spite. or a hateful mode with somebody else and yeah. then all of a sudden it's you know i'm gonna give up music well i'll show who joan who are you going to show <laughs> you're you're truly hurting yourself music is actually a positive thing people heal better and laughter actually i had a a surgeon teach me that uh, when he operated on my foot somehow i got into another accident where my toenail looked like the leaning tower of pisa and <laughs> it needed to come off and i thought no 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 that can't happen. So I, he said, come on in, we'll take care of it. And that's only a torture you've seen in movies. You know, so <laughs> as a wonderful nurse, because we are the worst patients, I was literally <laughs> hugging, I think, the nurse who was nine months pregnant, asking, oh, I hope I don't squeeze that one out oh. because it was going to hurt me. And what I didn't see was he had a, like a, what looked like a pliers, a needle nose mm -hmm. pliers, pliers, because our father's a carpenter. Uh -huh. And he told a joke. Well, I burst out laughing, and he pulled the nail. And right, I, right during the yeah. heavy laughter, yeah. and then he's the one that cited the studies that showed, you know, that laughter is the best medicine. Because wow. it really is. A, you can't feel physical or emotional pain simultaneously with laughing. And some guy who had rickets or something extremely painful back in the day, he um, he yeah. has an article out. And he, he says about 20 minutes of laughter gave him an hour or more pain-free. Wow. I know. 
Well, I had a client, a young oh. man that did, I don't recall how many minutes of laughter every Very day. Cute. He Very came cute. up with this all on his own. Oh, it was cute. adorable. And oh, I knew, <laughs> and um, it was just to laugh every single day. And he was less depressed, less anxious. Yeah, he noticed. You know that. what I never assessed was were his ADHD symptoms improved, which I think they probably were. But that's, I think it's because he moved away so quickly because he got better. Uh, with laughter, and I'm sure other things, of course. Yeah, question. Yeah, I, curious. Uh, so, uh, with, with me being a professor, as you call it, uh, <laughs> and, <laughs> uh, um, it, I, I do have the ability to teach college age students, and some uh, come come back in a non traditional way, very various ages and, and reasons, and, and I. Uh, I like particular those students because they they have more I'm say experience and and more uh, they're able to share some of those experiences with, with some of the uh, some of the other students. But I'm, I'm I'm curious because many of my students they're looking for out, out of school and even for internships they're they're looking for you know the almighty dollar it, you know being assigned to you know their job title and and, and what they do versus having that emotional tie to the profession. And uh, from our conversation today, I'm just curious, did you always have kind of that emotional tie to what you wanted to do? Um, because it, it, it seems like you, you're emotionally tied in when, what, besides individually uh, as the diagnosis and, and, and going through, uh, going through the, the, the mental side, uh, but from kind of a profession side, ha have you, always been emotionally tied into whatever whatever that was well i saw a, a show this is J the younger twin a show barbara walters was being interviewed and she had a, a very difficult time getting into the uh, profession because she was a woman the, the journalism profession and what her i believe it was her grandfather told her that barbara i don't care if you're if you get a job emptying the trash in the newsroom, you be the best trash em emptier that anyone has seen. And, you know, I think back in our day, it, people were more willing to actually work for free and say, hey, I'll do this for free for a day. And if I'm good, you can hire me. And I, I always had that as a work ethic. And I believe it came from our father. But our mother worked really hard, too. But our father always spoke about it. So um, I also want to say that from professionally, I followed Jane. I needed a job. She told me that I could be a nurse. And I said, I can't be a nurse. I'm not that smart. I said, I, if I could be one, you could be one. <laughs> so she explained all the um, rotations. And I said, wow, psychiatry and surgery. I said, I could do either of those. And I picked psychiatry and go, like Jane and going through it, I loved it back in the early 80s. Staff were so kind. I. I had never seen even a priest except that one guy, Father Bruni, was so kind. They shipped him back to Italy. We oh. all loved him. I, I hope he didn't do anything. But anyway, uh, it, the kindness back in the early 80s from the top down, you know, you hear that mm -hmm. trickle down effect. It yeah. does work in families mm. and in uh, jobs. But uh, I don't believe it works in politics. I think it, the tax system. I think it works within a family system. So we were kind. You couldn't even restrain an individual unless they were. They taught us that you can't hit, hit certain pressure points. You know, you have to be really good. Anyway, mm -hmm. fast forward. Average length of stay back in the '80s for a uh, mental illness was 10 months. Ab and you weren't in prison at this. We took people out to eat routinely because those things worked. We, we had them going to college. Uh, some people were in AA. You had to go to meetings with them. And people all thought I was um, denying because I just used to say pass. But pass yeah. Anyway, because you had to pretend you were just in there. You could for confidentiality. But fast forward, average length of stay at a major hospital in Connecticut is 10 days. That is not long enough to reacclimate to the community. You are speaking, though, of a long-term psychiatric facility. I, I was. So a long-term, the only time. Not that I believe in it anymore. When we, look, when we think of long-term in the current times, it's mostly with people who suffer from addiction. 
And as we know, they get approximately 30 days. And I don't know if the statistics, the statistics, the statistics <laughs> have changed Sorry. since um, maybe 2005-ish, that out of 100 people who entered a rehab for addiction and completed their 30-day program, one year later, like 1% were, were still in recovery. So the yeah. statistics are there that you know, look at the opiate crisis. And so we're always, to answer horrible. your question, always been for the underdog since we were little. We didn't really walk, I guess, until we were really late. People thought, 18 months old, people thought we were odd. And going through school, you know, we had, a, we, we had we some stuff were, done. So. <laughs> because, you know, oh, you have a mole on this side. Jane had a mole on that side. It was, you were under a microscope. I wanted it all to stop. Yeah. So we became... Well, that book, other book, besides our book, is wonderful and will make you laugh. But yes. the other book that was number one for PTSD, I, I was going to go back to the 80s. In the 80s, the DSM, apparently, or when it first came out, it had, every diagnosis had a human reaction to trauma, schizophrenic type, a human reaction to trauma, bipolar type. I, I never saw that DSM. But because it has changed, it changed immediately, apparently. But the psychiatrists acted that way in the early 80s. As, a, as nurses, you had to go in if somebody had, um, you know, if it was same sex or, or not same sex, you had to have a third person in the room to make sure whatever, nothing happened. So we would hear these patients' traumas, and they really, really tried in the 80s to develop that. But, you know, late 80s business took over healthcare, and the rest is his, 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 his history. It'll be his, it'll be his. What, well, isn't that a song? I think it's history. history. Um, um, a fairy tale. I want to say The Wizard of Oz. I just don't know. But I hope we answered, because we have been um, passionate about it, and uh, I guess we were passionate about being nurses. So what really seems to be, with the, you know, now that we're a lot older and we can reflect on it, and, you know, psychiatric nurses in the 80s, and retired in maybe 2020. Mm -hmm. How the um, everything is is gone. Pet therapy, music therapy, art oh, excuse therapy, me, art therapy. Not in not in um, some places. There's a Smilo has a uh, there's a Smilo Cancer Center in New Haven, Connecticut that I would give an A plus. And our dad did have a cancer, but that is not what he passed from. And he, we were honored that there was no beds in the main hospital and he had to go into the um, Smilo and he got superb care and it was amazing. I um, think there's art therapy But anyway, so they, they get rid of all these programs. The outings especially, um, that went immediately. There was no more taken. We t I took so many yeah, people, take like that away. five or six patients at the time mm -hmm. to on a ski trip to Vermont. There were five staff that, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and you know, I had to sleep with a key to the little med box. It was exciting and wonderful for people to relearn, mm -hmm. which apparently is the way to go with PTSD, is to relearn how to be with others in society and you're gonna change your brain now. I'm not gonna hardwire A to C anymore. I go to A to B to C and I will have a normal reaction right. instead of you know, screaming bloody murder or whatever I'm doing. Anyway, I cried when I read the book because yes. the body keeps the score. You think yeah. this part is is uh, wonderful. I'll take a pill. <laughs> I think we all forgot about the neck down and Bessel van der Kolk doc, um, doctor, right? Yes. Yeah, he explains that mm -hmm. um, really amazing. And there's an amazing gentleman. Um, yes. I don't know if he's in Connecticut or not because we had done a podcast with him and I thought he was, but he works with veterans. Oh. And he does exactly that where he takes these trauma, traumatized veterans out and they do all the activities that, you know, a guy in the army, a chick in the army, a navy, whatever. Whatever they like to Whatever do. we're doing. As I wanted to join the Air Force and I never did. But he does, he takes people out and he they do the activities. And that's exactly what in got a safe, people better. In a safe environment. Yep. And I wish we could do more of that because if you look, there's um, psychiatric patients, um, they're going into therapy or inpatient. It's a revolving door. Yep. People are spending too much time in therapy because the community isn't there to support because yep. we've, we've taken community away and COVID did that a little bit too. And I'm hoping 
that we aren't all like, you know, 9-11, we're all friendly, I guess, and kind for a, a couple of months, but people go back to their road rage and they're not whatever they don't do. And it's not even the people, it comes from the top. We need more community. Yeah. Oh, cause you know what people forget? Oh, that's the song too, people forget. Yes, the who, uh, I know that one. Hiding. Yeah, I like that. Um, people forget that uh, it's not the masks. What were we doing? On eminence front, I'm joking. No. <laughs> I don't know what I was gonna say. Oh, well, I hope I remember that people forget something. Oh, I wanna say that don't forget that uh, when you're sitting in a chair and in therapy, Mm -hmm. that's wonderful but eventually you know because we tried to do groups as well and people are a little resistant eventually one-on-one -on -one, it probably isn't the best you know people used to mm -hmm. say Joan now I remember why I came to you because you know I made people laugh but I also <laughs> made people cry because you should cry in therapy actually <laughs> you really should get it get it away now and then you can leave it if you never cry or confront it it pops out during holidays, oh, when you're you know you're trying older. to start a relationship. Now the guy hates you because you opened mm -hmm. your mouth. All Our dad it. started crying at a TV commercial. I mean, it does come out eventually. Yes. Yeah. Do you? Well, I don't know if we answered. So, uh, as a ha having been prescribers, uh, is that becoming too big? of a part of psychiatry do you just way like, big in your in your way opinion? too big well it not only in psychiatry it's the entire uh field of medicine we i did a lot of medical nursing in the 80s mm -hmm. and um you know the far i love medication i would like to start with uh, when you need it um sometimes with you know you could do your cognitive behavioral therapy more but you know a little lexapro does help and we've been you on know, medication. We've been on meds. I believe in them. My son was immunized. Um, <laughs> blah blah. <laughs> but uh, we have become a pill nation, and and I don't think it's a hundred percent the pharmaceutical industry's fault. Yeah. The consumer wants a quick fix. Again, it's probably if a, a sociologist or anthropologists could come up with how we can slowly improve our society i think we really it's it's the society last it's, it's insurance driven too because we were audited to the point where it's like i'm just gonna give up my license <laughs> why well, we passed it all though yeah <laughs> i mean it was grueling though and uh, what the anthem excuse me i shouldn't have mentioned that <clears throat> one well it was educational what they mentioned was you you two were two of seven people seven individuals 11. i think it was seven, it was seven. in 11. the state that did both therapy and medication and that was becoming obsolete and, and if somebody so had the longer, 45 minute, a longer visit oh she just said so if somebody has a 45 minute session yeah. um you know insurance companies would rather reimburse a 15 minute session they would just rather do that. So we got audited to, to the point where they threatened to take all of our money back from from unless we give gave them the charts. Unfortunately, what happened was we charted things that human beings that were coming to us said that is not going out of this office, and our hands were tied, and it it got ugly. But it all passed in flying well, colors. We, we had to cut the up. End. We had to cut up little pieces of paper and tape them, or oh, to redact it to redact yeah. all the personal stuff that you put in there. And and you know the, the if you don't put and and sometimes the personal stuff could be a theme. But again, you know, did I want people to know that I had to work at being empathetic? You know, I, I don't. I could tell the world now because it doesn't matter as much. And I, I, I remember observing my mother, our mother, huh. at wakes and funerals. And when I ever said to her, Mommy, you know exactly <laughs> what to say to people that have suffered a loss, I, I thought that was amazing. And I'm the psych nurse. I'm like, you are amazing. Anyway. I remember something. Good. Good. A lot of comedians have suicided, and I, yeah. I think that people mistake um, somebody who's funny as never being being suicidal. And I would like to share that I was suicidal. Mm -hmm. I what I kept misinterpreting because mm -hmm. I'm the younger twin, and I had a 
brain tumor and at six months they had to operate and apparently we had family therapy apparently the therapist finally identified our family as everyone was too involved in my life and i was always screaming at people to just let me be but i liked that they said did you forget your phone don't forget your purse i kind of i liked that part yeah. so i want to say with the she, comedy she didn't like the part where someone was banging on the bathroom door every two seconds mm -hmm. yeah like people got concerned if i was like whatever yeah. anyway no one thought i was suicidal and it was almost annoying that no one wanted yeah. to help me so you know that being said i want to say <clears throat> I was suicidal. The first time I was suicidal, I actually didn't have the right plans because um, I had heard benzodiazepines were safe in overdose and I didn't have any of those. So I didn't know what to do. But then as a, at, when I got my master's- but they I, are safe in overdose. They, said that they in, have been safe in overdose, in, not everybody. So were, did you want to take pills? Well, no one would prescribe me a benzo. Oh. For so long that Jane had to teach me and role play when I went to another psychiatrist so that I could actually be medicated what I felt properly. Because I got two master's degrees on Xanax, Ativan, or Clonopin, mm -hmm. or a combo of two of them. And it was wonderful for me. It was the, I cried when I first took it yeah. because I could not believe that other human beings existed without that energy system i thought i was plugged into an outlet inside my body mm -hmm. like i really it was bad anyway i feel sorry for my mm -hmm. organs because i didn't get help until i was three i didn't coach you because i would have had yeah. to have sat in and done the session as you and i know but you asked that. me how no what i know what i did was i sent her to a prescriber that was um friendly with the, those types of medicines because not everybody is. Right, and we got in trouble and for we prescribing them. I should have lived them. Yep, me too. <laughs> our background was but we're rebels so. back in the day. Those psychiatrists, most of them are dead now that were our mentors. Mm -hmm. So we, we were big believers in benzos because you get on them, do you become addicted? Absolutely you become addicted. But there is a way to come off them or a way to help prevent the addiction long term but I needed them more than once a day. So mm -hmm. I, and then I de with, I detoxed myself cause I had a lot of detox experience. Why don't you <laughs> tell them about addiction and how they don't get any care? <laughs> yeah, d please do. Oh, oh well, well, you tell know speaking, what Doug Bruce said. Speaking of the stigma, even within the profession, but hopefully everybody is doing, you know, when they do have those feelings, I hope everybody is getting help from their mentors, their peers. Or right? being confronted by their peers. Yes, sir. you know. But within the whole system, like I said, I've done medicine too. Um, there's this wonderful psychiatrist um, that I didn't even hear him speak, Joan did, and she told me what he said. And what he said was if a diabetic um, get symptomatic and even a diabetic that, you know, Joan and I, there was something about us that uh, so many of our clients shared things with us that they, they're pre they were with someone for seven years previously. And when you say, well, what did Dr. So-and-so or what did so-and-so mm -hmm. have to say about this issue? Well, I, I didn't, I didn't say that. that. I didn't tell them. <laughs> okay. All right. And I wouldn't tell them. I wouldn't tell them that. that right. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, when a diabetic gets symptomatic, and that is a life, can be a life-threatening thing, right? They get more care all the way up and, to the- And sometimes they eat the-, the Oh, and, and of course, bad so our foods. clients said they went to a wedding and had so much fun and they uh, figured out how much more insulin they needed because gosh darn it, I'm having cake and this mm. and, and alcohol and this and that. But the substance abuse. So they go all the way to the intensive care unit. They could have a, a leg amputated, a toe, whatever, right? Long term, yeah. Well, we know the consequences of an untreated mental illness. It could be you're killing yourself every once in a great addiction. while or of, uh, with addiction. And every once in a while, you know, alcohol, every once in a while. I don't know the statistics. It's not, mm -hmm. it's probably a lot. There's a lot of violence when someone mm -hmm. is around someone that can be an angry drinking person anyway so Dr. Doug get Bruce, less hair they get less. Oh, the, the oh. quote here's the quote here's the quote <laughs> so Dr. Doug Bruce came to speak at Yale when I was working at Yale as a RN maybe I had my master's I don't recall and he said in every other aspect of medicine uh patients 
get. When they're symptomatic, symptomatic they, they get, get more care. care. Except addiction, when they become symptomatic, we give them less care. And I thought, wow, because I was on the substance abuse unit. And that stayed with me all the way to my first master's in forensic science. I was, um, my internship was a death investigator. Hmm. And they liked nurses. They did. Because we would understand the medicines that were at the scene and a lot of stuff. Hmm. So um, the place you were working at and the, the, yeah, I forgot. Oh, right. The place I had, I was working at was the ME's office, medical examiner's office. And we had to go to the crime scenes. So one winter in Connecticut, there was so much snow that, you know, it was, they were telling you on television, they're getting rid of homeless people have to go here and you have to stay indoors. That's how cold it was. Well, somebody, uh, went out drinking a woman in a wheelchair went from her rehab it was an open unit, I guess. She went out drinking. So we get called that there is a woman frozen to death outside of the rehab. And when I got there, she had a sweatshirt over her head like that. And that's how she froze to death. Oh so, God. you know, at that point, I was like, you know, I'm going to go become a nurse practitioner because I don't even like this job. I was around so much death, so many hangings from a oh, doorknob, a children. Camera. With, they said, oh, John, can you get the blood out of the fingernails? Not when she has a onesie on or he, no, I can't. The adult who had his head chopped off because he got into a car accident and had the fence, I have no problem. You're an adult. I, I, I don't have a problem. I was sexually assaulted as an adult and I told all my clients, if you were molested, your trauma is so much worse than mine because I knew what was happening. Mm -hmm. You don't. And that confusion causes those, those clients way more difficulty, including if somebody doesn't validate them. Unfortunately, as human beings, if we're not validated, yeah. you're part of the problem if you don't validate somebody. You know, wow. move on after that. We, don't, we shouldn't be validated yeah. every day. <laughs> it's like, yeah, okay, that, I can yeah. use Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. Very, thank very uh, transparent, intimate. Fortunately, that's actually the end of our time t today. But that's okay. Uh, so we want to we want to thank you for joining us on the Voices for Voices podcast, and thank you also to our guests, the therapy twins, Joan and Jane, for spending some quality time with us today. Wide ranging topics. I hope you enjoyed it. And until we next did. time, <laughs> I am Justin Allen Hayes, and I hope you have a great day and be a voice for you or somebody in need. Thank you.